So my name's uh, John and I'm uh, from, I was born and raised in Sydney and uh, moved to Melbourne when I was 23. Uh, so I've only ever lived in Sydney and Melbourne until uh, a few years ago, uh, back in 2012, things uh, started to get interesting in my life. And um, so I, uh, I was uh, trained as a youth pastor and worked as a youth pastor for a little bit, but then life took a different uh, direction, uh, did some more study and uh, ended up working as a lawyer in Melbourne and I, I met and married a Melbourne girl and uh, that was, I thought that was me sorted in, and we, um, we had a child and uh, her name's Poppy, uh, she's 12 uh, right now and so we were uh, all set up to just do life in Melbourne and I was very content to do so and figure that that's what God had for me and I was very pleased that that was what uh, God had for me. And then things started to get a little bit, little bit silly, uh, to be honest. So that's what it felt like. Uh, in 2012, at the start of the year, my wife Catherine was uh, praying one morning and just felt the Lord give her uh, a vision of a place that she'd seen. She'd watched some documentary on or something like that. A place called, it's called Moldova. It's a small country in Eastern Europe, part of the former Soviet Union. And uh, there's a lot of poverty there. It's the poorest country in all of Europe. And people, there's lots of trafficking. Uh, so that where uh, lots of kids who are at risk of being trafficked in that place. So they've got some, some really serious problems right there in Moldova. And so the Lord spoke to Catherine and gave her a vision of a property uh, that was... Uh, looking after orphans and caring for them and had included a school where people, you know, obviously people, students are studying and getting education and, uh, and some sort of business attached and greenhouses and there's a church that's a part of it and everything like that. And Catherine was just like captivated that this was God's calling to her. And she was instantly, immensely excited about it and, you know, woke me up and said, blah, 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 blah. And I'm just like, what, 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 what? What do you mean you want me to pack a suitcase? Like, what are you talking about, love? Uh, and she was so keen, so quickly, that we should upend our entire lives and head to this place called Moldova. And I'm just like, oh, goodness me. No, right? No, let's not do that. How about we have an ordinary week instead, you know? I was terrified that she might have actually heard from God. I was terrified that that, might, that would not do at all. And so I, I didn't know uh, what to do about it, so I just said, look, no. Um, and we had three months where we sort of had this pretty tense home situation where, because she was like, this wasn't the sort of thing that by lunchtime she decided, oh, no, what was with that? Yeah, that was a bit weird. No, no, she was, she was absolutely convinced. And with each passing day, she was even more and more convinced that this is what God was calling us to do. And so we, uh, we had a, few, a tense couple of months. And then in June 2012, I felt the Lord speak to me at a, in a church event during the worship time. And uh, God gave me three short sentences. Move to England, plant a church... And that church is the base for the missions work into Moldova. Uh, and I was like, oh, Lord, that is, that is more than what I was asking for out of, out of this worship time, I tell you. So, uh, and basically, that was June 2012. And over the next 13 months, God just gave us confirmation after confirmation after confirmation. At every intersection, there was a green light. And so 13 months after the Lord spoke to me in that way, we touched down at Manchester Airport to begin a new life in the UK, uh, planting a church right there in England. And God directed us to a town in West Yorkshire in the north of England. And away we went, planting a church. And uh, we've since done uh, six missions trips into Moldova. And God's opened all sorts of doors. We've made lots of connections. And just uh, a few weeks ago, we were there running a, a day children's camp and everything. And uh, it looks like the Lord's given us the right people to connect with there. And so we're looking at buying a parcel of land over there in the coming years. And we'll just let the Lord you know, direct us and develop that in his timing rather than ours. And I'm, I'm, a, uh, I'm 
I like to rush, and uh, so I've discovered that the Holy Spirit does not rush. Uh, and even if I want to rush, I am unable to persuade him to start rushing. Uh, it's been many thousands of years uh, that he's been going at his own pace, and uh, he's still doing that despite my efforts to, uh, to move, him along, move him along the road a bit faster. So, uh, so that's a, a little bit of my story. And uh, since we've been in Britain, what we've found is that there's, uh, God's put us in a small town. It's a town sort of the size of Ballarat or Bendigo. And uh, I love, now that I'm out of the congestion of Melbourne, I'm just, I could never even think about going back. Um, it's just, oh, the thought. You know, and so I love uh, living in a town and it's, uh, God's just really given us a heart for putting strong churches into towns across the north of England. So uh, our church is called Northern Lights Church and that was just a name that someone suggested to us and everyone seemed to think it was cool. Uh, and so I said, well, far be it from me to go with something uncool if everyone thinks this is cool. So we went with the name Northern Lights Church and I didn't care too strongly about it one way or the other. But since we've been in England, what we've discovered is that God's put our mission into our name and our mission is to light up the north of England for Christ uh, by putting strong Bible-believing churches into uh, towns that have very few, if any, uh, churches that are preaching the gospel full of fire, enthusiasm, and everything that we have. So uh, it's been an extraordinary ride ever since that day in 2012 when, uh, when God gave uh, Catherine the vision that he did. Uh, but I thank God for it, and uh, it's been brilliant to be a part of it. And one of the beautiful things that's happened through this journey is that uh, the church we're a part of back at the time said, well, you know, that's not something that we would get behind, but, you know, good luck to you if you want to do it. And, um, uh, and that's, that's fine. There was no obligation on them to, uh, to do it. But we then ended up in a church in Melbourne that's a part of uh, the CRC uh, that this church is uh, a part of and is central to. And uh, we just thank God every day for our CRC family. It's just been a brilliant connection that we've been able to make. And it's just been a brilliant week for me to come over to the conference and to learn from everyone and, uh, and just build the connections with those in our church family. And uh, I've, I've loved it. I want to, before I open the Bible with you, I just want to, want to share something. We had, in our church in the UK, we had a guest speaker come in and, uh, and really a strong gift of prophecy on his life and everything. And often uh, when you have a, a guest uh, speaker in, they'll sometimes you know, prophesy uh, to the whole church. And, and as the pastor, you're certainly paying attention in that moment when that happens. And so, and really... Deep down, look, this is pastor's little secrets, right? So, so don't like, keep this within this room, right? Because some pastors out there that might be embarrassed by this fact if you knew it, but right, just, just on the sly. In that moment, what the pastor really wants is for the guest ministry to say, this church is going to explode in growth and become tremendously influential and huge and massive and just going to kick the devil's butt every single day of the week, non-stop, right? That's what the pastor wants to hear, okay? Um, shh, shh. But anyways, obviously I'm, as, as a mature Christian, that's like, I'm just like, you know, Lord, whatever you want to say is what I want to hear. And so, but this guest minister got up and he said, you know, I just really feel in God that this is, this is a safe place, that this is a church that will preach the gospel and will be a safe place for all those who come in. And I was like, cool, <laughs> I guess. You know? But as time's gone on, what I've realized is that's actually a really powerful thing. That that's actually a real. I really treasure that word. Uh, and at the time, I was like, "Meh," uh, but now I'm like, I really treasure that God spoke that about our church, and I'm really thankful for it. And so, I say that because uh, I wanted to say that I just I so appreciate this church, and I so appreciate Pastor Bill 
and uh, his leadership and his vision, uh, both of this congregation and of the movement as a whole. Uh, and it's just such a pleasure for me and such a privilege to be a part of the movement that, that this church has such a central role uh, in moving forward and everything. So you, you might not, particularly if you're one of the younger ones in the room, you, you just might not realise what a special thing is going on here. And in my experience, young people often, in fact, adults quite often, uh, will just change church like they're changing shirt. Um, but a church is a family. And you just, if God's put you in a family, then you stay in the family. You know, you don't, if there's a real, in, if you live on number 35 on your street, and five doors down in number 25, there's a really lovely family. You, you don't just walk out of your family and go and join theirs, do you? <laughs> right? Even if they'd welcome you, it's still a dumb idea, right? <laughs> if God's put you in this family, you stay with the family, right? And I think you are so blessed to be part of the church family that you are a part of. So uh, I've loved my day with you guys. I really loved it. And I really value uh, this congregation and Pastor Bill. I hope you're praying for him. I'm praying for him. Uh, so I hope you're praying for his health and everything like that. Let's open the Bible. Um, do you know back in the day, Jesus was a big deal. Like Jesus was completely famous. Uh, Jesus, when Jesus was walk, uh, around ministering for those three years, uh, when he was doing his public ministry, he was, he was like a rock star. As a carpenter, it wasn't a big deal. But as a preacher, you better believe he was a seriously big deal. He had such crowds following him that it, he found it quite difficult to simply lead an ordinary life, to simply uh, get away, have some time by himself, a bit of time in prayer, to do something as simple as that was actually really hard for Jesus because crowds followed him everywhere. The miracles that he did and the, the way that he taught, he just kicked up such a stink that he was the, kind, he was the guy that everyone was talking about that everyone wanted a piece of, like Jesus was a rock star when it came to religion in ancient Palestine around Nazareth, you know. Um, so it was a big deal for the people who lived back then. Um, and Jesus had all sorts of people who sought an encounter with him. So right now we're doing a, and you're doing a short series on encounters with Jesus. Many people we read in the gospel had powerful encounters with Jesus. There were many people who sought after him and when they did encounter him, radical change came into their lives. There were people who were healed of incredibly serious diseases, people set free from demons, people uh, taught and inspired by his ministry. There were all sorts of people who had powerful encounters with Jesus. But not everyone. Some people had an encounter with Jesus and they walked away thinking, oh, I didn't really, wasn't really happy with that. You know, every now and then uh, in this social media dominated age, someone will have an encounter with someone who's powerful, or with someone who's, you know, well known, and the person who's well known will just be a bit of a jerk. And if that goes on social media, you know, a big fuss is made and everything. Oh, no, rich and, rich and famous person being a turkey to someone who was just wanting an autograph or something like that, you know. That can happen in this day and age, right? But Jesus met a couple of people who, if they could have posted on social media about how disappointed they were with their encounter, their long-awaited encounter with Christ, they probably would have. It didn't work out for them. And I'm talking about three guys whose stories are told super briefly at the end of Luke chapter, Mark, chapter 9. So this is, we'll uh, pick it up, verse 57. This is what Luke records. 
As they, meaning Jesus and his followers, were walking along the road, a man said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. In other words, hey Jesus, I'm a fan. I love your work. I'm in. Where are we going? I'm signing up for your team. Woo! Let's do it. And this is what Jesus says to him. Um, well, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Oh, well, that's encouraging, isn't it? Basically, what Jesus said to this guy is, you're saying that you want to follow me, but I'm not sure you realize what it involves. Because you see, buddy, right now, I'm doing, I'm itinerant, right? I don't have home base. I am traveling around, traveling around, traveling around, traveling around. And if you're going to follow me, it's going to cost you more than what you realize. And if this fellow wanted to follow Jesus, we're not told. We're not told what happens. We're not told what response uh, he then comes back to Jesus with. But it seems to me that uh, this passage implies that he doesn't want to uh, follow Christ, that he's disappointed uh, with, the, with what Jesus says. And so Jesus is trying to bring home to this man that if you're going to follow him, he is in charge of where you are. I don't mean where you're at in terms of like spiritually, like emotionally. I mean physically, like geographically, Google Maps-ish, you know, where you are on the earth. Jesus determines that. Jesus is in charge. The Bible is full of stories where God directly spoke to people about where they should go. God says to Abraham, go to the mountain that I will show you. It it wasn't any old mountain. No, no. It had to be the mountain. They had to journey for three days to get to the mountain. They passed a hundred mountains on the way, but it was the mountain where God told them to go. Prophet Jonah Lord speaks to him and says, go to the city of Nineveh. And Jonah says, nah, not so much. How about I go here or here or here or anywhere other than Nineveh? No, no. God said, Nineveh, get there right now. And so that's, that, that's the command he's given. Even the resurrected Jesus, when he's talking to his followers, obviously Jesus had uh, died and uh, been raised in the city of Jerusalem, but his followers were up from near where Jesus was born in Nazareth. That was uh, you know, plenty of miles away, and so none of them were local to Jerusalem. So Jesus specifically instructs them, stay in Jerusalem. Lord, we don't like it. We're kind of notorious here because you know how you got crucified? Well, it's not as though we're like super popular ourselves. So we'd really like to best be going back to our, home, our homes, our families. But Jesus says, no, no, you stay in Jerusalem until you're clothed with power. That's what they're told, stay in Jerusalem. If you're a Christian, what's going to happen is from time to time, God is going to instruct you on where, precisely where, geographically, where you are meant to be. And when that instruction comes, you've got an opportunity. You can either obey or you can disobey. But if you want to follow Christ, it's a matter of going where he says to go. Sometimes God will tell you where to go like just for that moment. So uh, I have a friend in England who was driving one day. The weather was bad. It was cold. It was raining. And uh, he was about to get onto a freeway. And the Lord said to him, turn left uh, down a back street. Could have got to where he was going through that route, but it wasn't the best route. And so he was like, Lord, that, that's, that's, not the, that's not the best way. So he just popped onto the freeway. About a kilometre down the road, he breaks down and he ends up sitting there on the shoulder of the freeway 
and look like one foot uh, from the side of his car, the trucks are thundering past and he sat there thinking how much better I would be if I were on the back streets like God told me to be. Right? Sometimes God will t tell you where to go because he's simply looking out for you. And so sometimes you'll get told where to go, not just for, for that instant, but indefinitely, uh, which is what happened to me. God says, move to England. And God, I know that I am precisely in the right place geographically according to what the Holy Spirit has told me. And I don't know if, if you ever, do you ever go on realestate.com just to, just for fun, just for entertainment, like not, not to make a purchase, but just, oh, I wonder, what, wonder what's going on aroundabouts, you know? And whenever I've done that, I just have such a strong sense that no, 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 John, no. You, I am, in fact, the, not only am I in the right town, in the right country, uh, that I am in precisely the right apartment and I just, it would be an absolute act of disobedience for me to move house at the moment, right? Because God has told me that's where I should be and simple act, act of obedience for me to do that. And as, as you go on in the Christian life, what's going to happen is on occasions, God will speak to you about where you should be. You've got to say yes when God says to do, to do that. And he might not for a season. I had a friend uh, back when I lived in Melbourne who was praying really hard. She, had the, uh, she and her husband were looking at the possibility of moving a couple of suburbs away from where they lived. And she was praying hard, Lord, should we do it? Should we do it? Should we do it? And the Holy Spirit spoke to her and said, I don't care where you live. I care how you live. Oof. In other words, God was saying, if you want to, do it. If you don't want to, don't. I'm going to fuss one way or the other. But on other occasions, he is fussed. Oh, he's very fussed. You read about a time he was fussed. Paul, in Acts 16, he's traveling through what's modern-day Turkey and uh, preaching and planning churches and everything, and he intends to take a road towards a particular, you know, through a particular region. And this is what Luke records in Acts 16. They headed for Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus didn't allow them to enter. Now, now I don't think that they were walking along and it was like there was a glass door there, boom, put there by the Holy Spirit. But it actually, oh, oh, that hurt. Did you hurt? That hurt you? Try, you try it. I don't think it was like that. I suspect that they were walking along and they just had a strong sense that God was saying, no, that's not the right route. That is not the right road. You do not be heading in that direction. Uh, I suspect that's what was going on there. And so as you do the Christian life, Simply walk in obedience when God says, go here. Don't go there. Stay where you are. Sometimes, sometimes the hardest gig is to stay. Heard a, heard a guy explaining, an American preacher once explaining how he lived in an area on the outskirts of Chicago. It's pretty, it's, it's not, not a tourist destination, put it that way, and uh, he was part of a large church that had uh, all sorts of trouble and problems and all the young people were leaving and, uh, and he was like in worship one day, uh, he was crying out to God, I'll go wherever you want me to go, Lord. And God spoke to him and said, do you love me enough to stay? Oh, oh I'll, I'll, ha I'll have a think about that one. And eventually he did. You know. uh, sometimes God will say stay when you want to go. But whatever God says, as Christians, we walk in obedience to the Holy Spirit's leading. The first guy we met, he didn't want to do that. But of course, you and I, we do want to do that. Other Christians struggle with these things, but here, we're doing what God says. Amen. Good to see that. Got, got good, good number of nods to that, that statement, so I'm pleased. I'm encouraged by that. Then he meets the second guy. Uh, verse 59, he said to another man, follow me. The man replied, Lord, 
first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. How harsh is this? What is Jesus playing at here? Poor man's just lost his father. Is it too much to ask to simply have a funeral? Can we not hold off for a couple of days until his father's body is at least cooled down and at least in the dirt? You know, must seriously we have to drop everything now and not wait for a simple funeral? It's his father. Well, there's a bit more going on here than what, what appears at first glance. Uh, back, at, back in ancient times, the, the custom uh, in Israel at the time was that uh, when someone passes away, they're buried in a shallow grave, uh, and then a year later, the bones are removed from the grave and put in a box and into, uh, into the tomb, into uh, perhaps the walls of a tomb, uh, so it could be that this guy was asking for a, a, an extension of up to 12 months uh, on his actually uh, joining Jesus and going with him. That's possible. Um, but here's the other factor that doesn't appear at first glance. When someone's parents pass away, what, what usually follows over the coming days and months? Yeah, sure, there's a funeral, but what else there's a reading of the will. There's an inheritance that comes to the children of someone who passes away. And so this guy, I think it's most likely that this guy is saying, Jesus, I just need to sort myself out financially, uh, collect an inheritance that might be coming my way at some point. Now, we don't even know if the father was, was actually dead yet, right? So it's not... His no, his father might have been a picture of health, uh, but he, sim he might be simply saying, once I'm sorted financially, then I'll be ready to go and follow you, Jesus. And you think Jesus is going to say, yeah, that's great. You just go, when whenever you're ready, mate, that's fine. No, of course not. Jesus says, you go and proclaim the kingdom of God, all that other stuff, It'll get sorted. You follow, you put God first and don't worry about everything else. That's what Jesus says to this second fellow. You know, if you want to follow God, it might cost you. I mean, literally cost you. Like you might, at some point, God might challenge you to be generous. If you've ever... Obviously, there's ongoing generosity, and I hope that uh, for those of you who are Christians, that you're generous with your regular income and everything. But of course, then there's, there's numerous, uh, life's full of numerous opportunities to give on top of that. And if you've ever asked God, Lord, what, sh what do you want me to give to this offering or that offering or this need or that need, uh, you better be ready to say yes to whatever the Holy Spirit says. It's a dangerous prayer to pray, isn't it? Lord, what do you want me to give? Because there's, I guess there's really, there's two, there's two sorts of giving, isn't there? There's loose change giving, which is one thing. Then there's lifestyle affecting giving. Oh, isn't that a whole different kettle of fish? Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, loose change giving is just like so easy. In fact, loose change is annoying, right? To, uh, if you ever get, you know, just a few cents change at the supermarket. It's just like, where's the charity thing? I don't, it's carrying it around is such, it's so unpleasant. I just want to, I want it out of my life entirely. I don't care what charity it is. Just, it's just a bin to me, You're right? Loose change giving is not hard. Even in the world, that they, they, they do lots of loose change giving, right? But lifestyle affecting giving well, that's what Jesus is asking of this man now. Jesus is saying, you follow me even if it costs you your inheritance. You follow me regardless. If you're going to follow Christ, he might require some serious financial sacrifices of you at different points along the journey. I don't, I don't know how he's going to lead you. Right? You can't predict when that's going to happen. But let me tell you this. If it does happen to you, 
I hope you say yes. And I hope that you're blessed from it. When I say blessed, what I mean is I don't, I'm not necessarily saying that you'll make all the money back you know, within the week or anything like that. That may or may not happen. Who knows? But, but I'll tell you two guys who encountered Jesus who were asked to give financially significantly and they had two different reactions but have a listen to the emotions that go along with it right Jesus met a guy who we call the rich young ruler and Jesus could see that he loved money and he certainly had plenty of it and so Jesus says to him give away all you've got and come and follow me and the rich young ruler says nah it's all right mate and he chooses not to follow Jesus And the Bible describes him leaving his encounter with Jesus. And the Bible says he went away sad. Because he didn't want to part with all the cash. Then elsewhere, Jesus is described meeting a, a tax collector, a guy named Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus also had lots of money is radically impacted by Jesus' welcome of him, Jesus' love of him. But Zacchaeus, similarly, he realises that the way that he's been living and the way that he's been accumulating wealth at other people's expense, that that God's not happy with it and that if he's going to follow God, then he's going to have to return all the money that he's stolen from so many people. In other words... Precisely the same as the rich young ruler. He's going to have to give away a lot of money. And Zacchaeus, it says he welcomed Jesus joyfully. The rich young ruler was sad. Zacchaeus was joyful. And Zacchaeus gives back generously to everyone that he's wronged. Right? If God ever asks you to be generous, like capital G generous, like lifestyle affecting generous, right right there, you've got an opportunity for joy. You, if, you, if you'll do it, if you'll say yes to God, joy is on the other side of that obedience. Or you can be like the rich young ruler and go away sad. You know, I was, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to ever crunch the numbers and work out if I'd have stayed as a lawyer in Melbourne and, if, you know, and now because I've done this. I, I, would, I would never um, want to do those numbers, right? But, but here's what I know. God has filled my life with joy. It is such an adventure to follow God, to serve God, to be in the center of his will Why would you ever want to be anywhere else but absolutely precisely where God wants you to be? Because that's where the joy is, right? That's where the adventure is. That's where the power of the Spirit lies. Like that is what you're put on earth to do, to be right in the center of his will. How could you? Don't ever let money stop you from being precisely where God wants you to be. This second fellow, he didn't get it. He didn't get it. Oh, let, let me hang on. I just got to sort out my inheritance. Jesus, no. You follow right now. It's like, ah, oh, no, I don't think so. He missed, missed a chance, it would seem. He missed out on his chance. Is the third guy that Jesus meets, 61. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus says, Yeah, okay, I'll just hang around for a bit. No, Jesus said, verse 62, no one who puts a hand to the plough and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Jesus is saying again, he's saying, I come first. You want to follow me, you have to put me first. It's that simple. You know, I've been been a father uh, to my daughter now for uh, 12 years, almost 13 years, and I reckon over that time, I would have watched, like, have to be over a hundred kids' movies, you know, animated movies. And the reason why I've watched so many of them is because I really like them. Like, like, many of them are, like, seriously good. Like, Toy Story, like, these, these are great movies, right? Never mind if my daughter likes it or not. I like it, you know. Um, 
And you know what? You know what? So many of them, so many of them, their theme is it's all about family. It's all about family. Not the extended family, good grief, no. That's like, you know, like the, the grandma in Ice Age, she's just there as like a joke. But it's all about the nuclear family. In our culture, the nuclear family is uh, one of the things that we value highest of all. Now, I happen to love my family uh, a great deal. Uh, beautiful, beautiful family, and I could spend the next hour telling you about how beautiful they are and everything like that. Right? I love my family. But let me tell you this. I love Jesus more. I love Jesus more. When God told us, move to England, that meant that our daughter came with us. She had no say. No say whatsoever. Do you think she... I mean, she now lives on the other side of the world from her cousins, her aunts, her uncles, her grandparents. And that was our decision and she had no say in it whatsoever. But I don't apologise. Because Jesus comes first. Obedience to him comes first. This third fellow wanted to put his family first. There's nothing wrong with loving your family. But there's everything wrong with loving your family more than you love Jesus. If you're a parent, if you, one of your kids came to you and said, I want to be a missionary one day, how would you feel? Ooh. Ah, as, as a Christian parent, I'm sure you, more than anything, you want them to love God and serve him. But what if they wanted to serve him like on the mission field? Not every Christian parent would say, well, praise God. But, but God comes first. God comes first. That's what, how it is. He's Lord of all. And he's Lord of our lives. And the funny thing is, of course, that by putting God first, we have better family life than those who put family first. Because this is how God made us. God made us to worship him, to serve him. Uh, but of course, many of you would, uh, I'm sure some of you have family members who aren't Christians and so some of you have family members who don't like the fact that you're a Christian who takes their walk with God seriously. Uh, and so sometimes it's difficult in those situations where you're getting opposition from other family members. But I want you to know, if you're putting God first, you're pleasing him. He'd be so proud of you. You're doing the right thing. By putting God first. And that's what this third fellow couldn't get his head around it. But that's what Jesus is calling us to do. To put him first. Not family first. We love our families. But we put Jesus first. This is what we do. There's no looking back. Jesus says he who puts his hand on the plough and looks back. Not fit for service. But in this church, obviously other Christians struggle with it. But in this church, right? We're not looking back. Putting God first, moving forward. If you got baptised, then on the day that you got baptised, you committed yourself to looking forward, to walking in the direction that God is calling you to walk in. That's what we're doing as Christians. We're putting him first. So these three fellows, they meet with Jesus and they understand. They get taught what the cost of following him is. I think their encounters with Jesus were perhaps a bit more than they bargained for. I'm not sure they walked away really glad that they made the effort to seek Jesus out. But he calls them to follow him and put him first. There's a cost to following Jesus. Cost is high. Got to decide if you're going to pay the cost. You know, if you go shopping for something, if you see something, you see a pair of shoes, that you like, sometimes you, you'll have a look at them in the window and you think, oh yeah, they're nice. And then you walk away and you look at the next shop and then you sit down and have a bite to eat or a cup of coffee or something. And sometimes when you see something you like, five minutes later you've forgotten about it. But other times you'll be sitting there drinking your coffee thinking, the shoes. Oh my gosh, oh no, no, it's been half an hour. 
Has someone else bought the shoes? Oh, no. I need to get the shoes. I need to get the shoes. And back you go. Back you go to the shop, right? And in that moment, if you're, sit, you're looking at those pair of shoes, you don't need wise and persuasive words to deal with the staff member in the shop. You don't need to be well connected. You don't need an in with the owner of the company of the shoe shop, right? That's not what you need in that moment. If you want the shoes, you need one thing and one thing alone. You need to pay the price. Doesn't matter if you don't look your best. You put your money down, they'll sell them to you anyway, right? All you've got to do to get the shoes is pay the price, Right? If you want to follow Jesus, you, but you don't necessarily have to be as good looking as me. Right? You, don't have to, you don't have to have this or that or the other thing. If you want to follow Jesus, you just pay the price. And you walk with him and you end up doing all the things that he calls you to do. You end up going to the places where he calls you to go. You end up having the life that you were created to have. You end up doing the things that God planned in advance for you to do. You have it all if you pay the price. So let's pay the price in our lives this week. Right? Let's go where he says to go. Let's give what he says to give and let's put him first above all else in our lives. Right? Let's do that this week. Let's live a life where we're happy to pay the price to follow Jesus. Because what, what else would you do? Don't you love it? When Jesus teaches hard stuff like this, there's another part of the Gospels where it says, at this a lot of people stopped following him because he was preaching hard like, like he is in these verses here. And so he says to his 12 closest 12 disciples, he says to them, what about you lot? You're going to leave as well? And Peter, in a moment of brilliance, makes the point, leave and do What? Like seriously, what else can compare to walking with God and doing everything that God has planned for you to do? What compares to that? What can beat that? Nothing else comes close. So Peter says, you've got the words of eternal life. So where else are we going to head, Jesus? What a daft idea. No, of course we are not walking away. Of course we're going to follow you because you are the one. You understand it. You are God with skin on and we will follow you the rest of our lives. And he did. Oh, he had some ups and downs, but he did. And about 40 years later, he ended up being crucified just like his saviour was. Right? That's paying the price and following Jesus and having the life that he wants you to have. And I'm so glad that I'm in a room tonight full of people who have made that decision and are walking that walk. Would you pray with me? Let's, let's pray together.